Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight, sponsored today by Alation. Today, William will be discussing analytics ROI best practices. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADV Analytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the Q&A panel or the chat panel, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it the chat to network with everyone. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Miles from Elation for a brief word from our sponsor who helped make these webinars happen. Miles, hello and welcome. Hi there. Well, I was gonna share the screen, but you'll need to make that possible. Oh, well, yeah, that certainly helps, right? It does help. <laughs> there you go. Okay. And I'll put this into uh, slideshow mode. Yeah, so, you know, what you're going to get to dig into in the next presentation is going to be how do you justify um, the investment in analytics and prove that out. I wanted to share a few things that we've learned from our customers along the way uh, in terms of how they both use advanced analytics and the problems they've had along the journey and the value that they've gotten out of the process. So I'm going to start with Albertsons. Uh, Albertsons wanted to move to personalization. One of the big roads forward for digital transformation is to uh, change that customer experience. So one of the things they needed to do was move from just sending out a flyer to somebody that might have some things on it that were interesting to a flyer that would actually be personalized to things that their buyers uh, care about. And so what they had was they had to quickly do something and they were told, you know, go find this file called RTPP. And they did the person who was leading this initiative. And it was, it was an initiative that involved multiple countries um, didn't even know what RTPP standed for. And so what they were able to do is to go into the data catalog as a point of actually finding these things and quickly find out what RTTP was, what was it defined at, what tables, queries, and joins matter, and then start the process in the U.S. and transfer it to the Philippines and document it uh, in the catalog itself. And then they were able to get this delivered in a very quick time frame, which was actually four days. So there was an ROI of being able to very quickly uh, meet this business goal. And so one of the things I like to say, and you're gonna dig into the ROI um, in just a little bit, but it's always good to find the business ROI. Yes, there's time savings and these people were able to save a lot of time savings, but the real outcome uh, is on the business side itself. You know, If you can transform and use data to develop analytical models and actually deliver a changed outcome, that's a big thing. So one of the things we've found, and this is actually from a Harvard Business Review study that Tom Davenport did um, back in 2017, is that 80% of the analyst time is actually spent going and trying to do the same things Albertson was doing. Where's the data? And then prepping that data. So, and then finding out at the same time, is that data trustworthy or it's not trustworthy? So. Um, if we can do anything to shave that time, it has impact. Yes, we can talk about analyst productivity or the productivity of the data scientists themselves. But if you can actually uh, go and do something where you're taking a uh, time out from uh, the building of models, you can make your analysts stretch over a longer period of time, your data scientists stretch over a longer period of time. If you don't follow them, Kirk, uh, uh, born, uh, Boone, I'm sorry, uh, is a really interesting gentleman, and he's also written about this extensively um, in the articles he's published, and he's got one of the largest followings I know in the tech community uh, on Twitter. And one of the things he said that I thought was really interesting is that 
uh, as much as we like to dig into the models and try different models and see what the outcomes are like, um, they oftentimes we could call uh, the people who do this work better uh, data plumbers versus data scientists. And so uh, if we can make people more productive, uh, at this process, there's a real outcome at the end of the process. Whoops. So one of the things that we see increasingly is that we want to get people out there and working with the data, in particular, the, the data scientists, as we've been discussing all the way along, who are really involved in engaging on self-service. So when I've asked CIOs and CDOs, what do they think? What's the value if you could self-serve over having somebody having to go find the expert, uh, it's a shorter time to value, just like we saw with Albertsons. Um, there's lower business costs because you can stretch people across a bigger thing. It means you can uh, uh, attach to a bigger agenda. Um, business agility, if you see, again, what Albertsons was talking about, they wanted to move quickly. Uh, they wanted to use data as an advantage. And then obviously, you know, other things that matter are decision making and transformation. Um, and so these are big agenda items that when you talk to CIOs and CDOs, they're trying to, to get after. And, you know, we've really come up with um, four principles for, for doing this well. Uh, the first is that you need to fix the data value chain. You want people to be able to self-serve rather than put a request in because the request can take time. And in many cases, the data already exists. So if we can make it easier to acquire, immediately the ability to determine whether that data is trustworthy and where, if there are issues, there's issues with the data itself, and then focus the data engineers on creating new assets. What you're doing is you're extending the IP that an organization has. So these were really some quick ideas I wanted to give you. Obviously, in order to self-serve, uh, BI, you need to allow people to find stuff directly. Just as I said earlier, like Albertsons, they need to be able to discover it's current and ready and all of those kinds of things. And one of the nice things is that catalogs enable you to do this. And the Relations Catalog in particular makes it easy because you're using natural language. And then you're able to look at queries that exist, sometimes modify them, and then address the data quality issues directly as you discover the data that you might. So that's what I wanted to share today. So I'm all done and I will stop the sharing and look forward to the Q&A, which will happen uh, in, in another few minutes. Miles, thank you so much for kicking us off with this great presentation. And thanks to Elation again for sponsoring today's webinar and helping to make these webinars happen. Uh, and now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations. His strategies form in the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks in leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Hello, everybody. And thank you, Miles, for leading us in here with that great presentation about self-service. And that's one of the things that does factor into ROI, as hopefully you will see throughout my presentation. I have some lofty goals for this presentation for you. I trust that uh, my screen sharing is working fine. Uh, at the end of this hour, I want you to be able to navigate an analytic justification. So if you're being asked, uh, what is the ROI on that project? Or should we continue with this project? Things like that. Or if you're forming a project that you want to propose within your company, you're going to want to think about the justification, of course, you're going to want to think about the ROI. So today's focus is on ROI. It's on analytic ROI. It's on those projects that are clearly analytic projects, but it's also on the analytic components of projects that may or may not have a substantial analytic component to them today. However, I will assert that most projects are going the analytic way over the course of time and must get there. So uh, right now we can talk about analytics ROI, but sooner or later, it just becomes ROI of the, uh, of the company. So I want you to be able to distinguish between tangible and intangible benefits. I think a lot of times, 
tech, technology folks, uh, people even like myself, you know, we can tend to get pretty excited about what uh, others may not get excited about. <laughs> you know, single version of the truth, clean data, things like this. Those are intangible. And I want to talk about that. If you're not going to measure it, uh, it doesn't really factor into a, a strict ROI. I'm not saying it's not part of justification, but it probably doesn't factor into a strict ROI. I want you to be, be able to present an itemized ROI and articulate the value of analytics within your organization. Just generally speaking, why do we want to do this thing called analytics, which I will define as we get along here. And adapt a methodology that includes ROI attainment and measurement. So you're gonna be able to show where the ROI is, ROI is going to come from and then measure after the fact. Now, these are some of the projects that I've been involved in in the past few years, uh, helped to justify these projects. Some of them are pretty big and just wanted to kind of put that out there. And, and so I know my way around getting projects justified in the organization. It's not something that we're ever trying to game. It's something that we're trying to do because it's going to drive the ROI of the company. And I think a lot of people know that, but then they they look at the mountain in front of them in terms of getting the thing justified. So if we take it step by step, we can get there and we can get down the path of doing the things that are absolutely essential to us as a company. And we're so often just paralyzed by things that we shouldn't be paralyzed by. So hopefully I'll give you a nugget or two here today that helps you move that ball along. And don't forget that we have to keep two hats on as we go. The architecture hat must stay on as well as the business hat. And the architecture hat, by that I mean, we're not doing damaging things to the company in the long term. We're actually making it more possible to get things done quicker and more efficiently after this project is done because we set up the future. That is good architecture. Uh, and we're also driving ROI and I know it's a balancing act and somebody or some buddies has to be able to put both hats on uh, almost at the same time sometimes. So you've got to know right now, am I wearing my architecture hat or am I wearing my business hat? And really be able to go back and forth. Next slide. Okay, let's define analytics a little bit here. Whoops, there I am. So I often get this, get this question. So what are analytics? Is that a query? Is that a project? Is it a philosophy? <laughs> what is it? So I, I say it's the process of utilizing data to enhance business processes. That's really it at a basic level. It's deeper though than simple knowledge. It's not select and then do, get doing a point query, selecting a customer's information. It has depth. Now you might select something like customer lifetime value. That's something that the customer has accumulated over the course of time. There may be their uh, origin to current spend levels. Now these are things that have depth. You're not gonna find the answer to those questions in a single record in a database unless that record has already accumulated other records. And that's what I mean by depth. So you can either accumulate der derivations uh, and uh, calculations within your data, or you can do that at runtime where you're pulling unique and advanced analytics. And that's all fine. It's all analytics. There's analytics projects, projects that are really geared to improving the analytics of the company or improving something within the company where, whereby analytics are so ultra important to that goal. And I'm gonna give you several examples as we go along. And then there's also analytics that are added to projects. And today, a lot, of, a lot of us are thinking about adding machine learning and artificial intelligence to projects where it doesn't exist today. So that might be your cue in terms of how you define analytics. This kind of depends on where you are. Measuring is important to business. And this is a quote I've been dragging around for a while. The essence of a corporate culture is the firm's measurement system. It is the lens through which reality is perceived and acted on. Yes, how we measure the things of the company is quite important. So there's a lot of things we can measure. Uh, the bottom line is the bottom line, but we don't all work on the bottom line of the company every day. So. We have to figure out some things that we can work on that are important as well. 
So hopefully we get there a little bit today. I'm going to, before I get into the, the math and maybe some of the justification and show you some examples of analytics, I'm going to acknowledge the strategic as a place for learning and innovation. And I'm going to acknowledge that not all projects within the company by a good margin are looking for nickels and dimes within ROI calculations. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of the initiatives are for learning and innovation. It's to target the unknown upside. And this is all for better or worse. I'm just talking about reality. The intuitive thinking employed by the highest paid person's opinions. These are definitely drivers within the companies. Although I will say I have noticed over the course of time that things are moving towards more analytic style and ROI style type of projects, especially as we start to um, start to become more mature as a company with having all the projects in place that need to be in place. Now we're trying to optimize on a lot of those initiatives. So let's talk about the workloads because we have to be able to divide our work up. And I'm gonna use sheep as an example and fences as an example, all right. So there's a there's an art form here inherent within this within this slide, which is how do we put the fences around the workloads, and what do we combine within a workload? Is it data? Yeah, sure. Is it processing? Is it people? Is it are we go are we tying this out to sales? I mean, what all is involved in a workload? And we have to know because we're going to try to target some ROIs here. And we're not doing the ROI of the company. We're doing the ROI of a project or maybe something that we don't call a project, but it's an initiative within a project, like adding analytics to the supply chain. Okay, something like that. We have to know what we're targeting here. We're not talking generally. We have to get specific if we want to do ROI. So how do you prioritize efforts within the organization? A lot of us are, are really hamstrung by this. We're paralyzed. We're looking at dozens of possibilities and it can be very paralyzing today. But I suggest to you that there's three basic things that you wanna think about in terms of prioritizing efforts. Sure, you can't do it all at once, even though it's all great, right? For one thing, there's a bit of a technology people shortage today. So that's going to, uh, that's going to limit some of what you can do, uh, as well as uh, company cultures, are not necessarily all about doing everything at once, but it's more about prioritizing and metering out uh, the benefits to the organization over time. So the first thing I look at is ease to do. If it's easy to do, I wanna do it. Yeah. And easy is relative, right? Compared to where you are as a company in terms of maturity of projects and that sort of thing. But if it's easy, I wanna do it. If it's a prerequisite, if it's going to set up something down the for the future, I want to do that too. I call that a prerequisite project. It has to stand on its own two legs, yes, but if it also helps to set up other projects that are maybe bigger and more important, then great. You see the art form inherent within doing this type of thing? And then finally, ROI. Very important. Um, so ROI is return on investment. It is about cash flow. It's about driving things to the bottom line of the organization. So the next time you see ROI as a request, I don't want you to cringe. I don't want you to say, that's impossible. As a matter of fact, it's quite possible that whoever's asking you for ROI is just sort of putting you off for the moment. And maybe they don't even have a great idea as to what they mean by ROI. But you're going to know after this presentation, you're going to know how to come back with something uh, that uh, really will move that conversation along, I would think quite a bit. And maybe you find out at that time that, oh, we didn't want to, we didn't really mean cash flow or we didn't want ROI. We wanted internal rate of return or the break-even point or something like that. That's fine. That's fine. You got the you got the conversation moving. And a lot of this is really easy once you do the hard part, which is figuring out what the cash flow is going to be. We'll get there though. Then what makes it difficult is its ordered benefits. We're not just selling subscriptions to say a data warehouse or some data set that we're collecting and refining and curating. We're not just doing that. Well, maybe we are, but 
probably we're not doing that. Probably we're trying to improve the supply chain. Probably we're trying to do targeted marketing. Probably we're trying to do predictive maintenance. Okay, these things have uh, an indirect relationship to the bottom line. So why would you want to do predictive maintenance? Well, I think we know, you know, we want to save money on parts. We're going to keep the planes in operation or whatever it may be. And that has a a direct effect on the bottom line, but it's still, you know, a little bit removed. And some things are quite a bit removed. And that's what makes it really difficult. But you can't just walk away from it because it's like that. If it's good for the company and you know it, find a way. And hopefully I help you a little bit with that today. We're going to talk about program versus project justification. You've got to know which one are you doing. So a lot of times, the program justification is typically going to be done on a lowest total cost of ownership basis. You don't have to worry about how the 10 projects are going to use the data warehouse if you're building a data warehouse, let's just say. You do have to worry about how you build that data warehouse and you want to build it to scale. You want to build it less expensively than the 10 other ways or the 100 other ways there is to there are to build a data warehouse today, for example. And a project more or less does have to stand on its own and usually is done with ROI or some form of ROI. So if you're justifying a project, analytics might be seen as a standalone project. Now, um, everybody has their own terminology and that's why I say things like this because I don't want to alienate anybody uh, in terms of how you think about what analytics is what a, what a data warehouse is, what a data lake is, what a this or that is. Because keep in mind that I or other people may have different definitions of these things. So I say that what I've heard is that analytics can be formed as a quote unquote project within the company. And even things that are, as I've, no, I've noticed over the course of time, things like supply chain management, which I do a bit of, supply chain management it used to be called supply chain management. And then it sort of morphed into some other things. And now some people are out there calling it analytics because it's so, it's, of course we do supply chain management, but we're doing analytics uh, over the top and very intensely within this project that we just call it the analytics project. Maybe you're justifying an analytics program, which is sort of a, let's say there's a corporate wide initiative to do more analytics, to do more, to bring more data to bear on how we operate as a company. And so there might be something centrally that you're working on that you're going to roll out, so to speak, to the organization, maybe one project at a time. But for example, analytics that store enterprise data, like a data warehouse maybe, or a data lake. Inclusion of data into that vessel, whatever it is, is based on governance, hopefully. And the goal of the program is to enable the component of the applications that it supports. So we're not gonna be responsible for the bottom line of all the 10 to 100 uses of the analytics that we build here, but we are gonna be responsible for how we build it. I hope this is making sense. This slide will help hopefully a little bit. What is being justified? An information management program or an analytics program, which will store data for several projects. So there are a question, a question might be why use the data warehouse architecture versus just letting people do what they want out there at the department level and building data marts independent of whatever else has gone on before. And why don't we just do that? How about a project? Maybe you're trying to justify a project which will use a data store to store data. Why do this project? And the inclusion of new projects into an existing data store program, like say, like, let's say you have a data lake. So should you put the data for this new project in the lake you have or build another one or put it in a relational database? So the question becomes really why architect this project into that data store instead of building an independent data store? So you gotta know why you're doing certain things. Now, obviously that last question is more of a TCO question, isn't it? It's not a question of how many more sales are we gonna get? or it's not a question of how are we going to reduce the expenses of the company. It's about how can we spend the least to get to our, to get to our goals? That's a TCO question, and which is very related to ROI. But let's talk about ROI first. It's just simply return minus investment over investment. Should always be supported within a time period. If you tell me, if I go to the bank and I say, you know, what's, what's my rate of return here going to be on this savings account? 
and I hear 5%, I say, great, 5% a day, that's wonderful. Oh no, 5% every year. Uh, actually, that's probably a stretch today, isn't it? But uh, <laughs> you see my point. It depends on the time frame. ROI should be presented with assumptions and risks and be itemized because we're not soothsayers here, right? We're not predicting the future completely accurately. We're not saying we can, but there's different ways that we can cut the ROI to say, okay, if we use these source systems, these subject areas, this business problem solved, this number of users, this blah, 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 probably 10 things, then we should get an ROI of such and such. And what you're doing there is you're forming the project because every project can go a hundred different ways, right? You can, you can say, okay, the project is gonna be 10 source systems. Or you can say, no, the project is gonna be the first source system. So which is it that you're justifying here? The ROI on the 10 or the ROI on the one? It all depends on how you want to approach it. Obviously, the bigger the better. You won't have to come back to the well. Maybe if you're if you're uh, if you're lucky, but uh, most likely you're going to have to roll things out on a smaller basis than multi a multi year project. You're going to have to show where the ROI is in the first let's say year, and how it's going to build over time after that. And you can use ROI for predicting and measuring your analytic success. Now, just a word on self-service, which Miles talked about, but it's one of the many things that plays in here. Because if you do things right, you are driving ROI. Self-service is a great example of this. It's not just about TCO. You might look at self-service and say, well, we're disintermediating IT out of the way in between us users and our data. And that saves money. Okay. Yeah, I, I grant you that. But I've had this philosophy for years and I haven't done any measurement on it. I'm not sure how I would, but I believe that users have a limited window in which they do their analysis, which dictate, dictates the depth of analysis. If you have dirty data like Miles was talking about, you know, the, the, the Kirk Bourne quote, all right? If you have dirty data that uh, and a bad architecture that your users are slogging through, and they're really data janitors and not data scientists, okay? That's a problem because they're not gonna be able to get very far. They have a limited window in which they're gonna analyze. But if everything is readily available, you've got a catalog there, like Alation explaining what's in there. They get it, they're not, they're not having to think about these basic things that you've, you've built once and you're using many times now uh, as, as, as you do with a catalog. Well, then you're gonna be able to go deeper as a user, you're going to be able to go seven levels deep, let's say instead of two, and then you're going to get better results. Now, what do those better results mean? Well, there's a hundred things that they mean, right? But if they're in the supply chain area, come back to that, they're going to be able to improve the supply chain with that deeper analysis, theoretically, but also I think pretty realistically. So these are some things that people tend to lump into analytics. Now, I got straight analytics in there. But I've got these other things in here in terms of domains. So you might be building a data warehouse or building out your data warehouse. Same thing with your lake. Master data management's really hot right now. Maybe you're doing that. Maybe you're doing what I've called analytics here today. Maybe you're doing customer relationship management, et cetera. All right. So I'm showing you here what the approach is for typically justifying those projects. And I know I've got the word or in there a few times. You're going to have to continue to think about some of these, but a data warehouse, let's just take the first one as an example. Should I build a data warehouse? Well, are you building, is it a project? Are you building it for a project? Are you helping that project? Is it just part of the project expenses and project benefits? Or are you building it kind of over here on the side, you're going to build it and they're going to be your first customer. There's going to be more. And then the question becomes, you know, the question of the first example is, what's the ROI of the project? We're just part of that. The question of the second example is, why should I build it as a data warehouse? Why not just slam something together as a quote unquote data mart for this project? Okay, I know that's kind of an old example. We're, we're, we like to think we're past it, but we're not really, but um, there are definitely more modern uh, examples within this slide. And I'll go on because there's some examples here. These are TCO examples. And I'm not saying don't ever use ROI on this stuff. I am saying though that what you really wanna do here with these questions 
which we're all fielding right now, by the way, uh, what you want to do with these questions is show the alternatives and the costs of the alternatives and the long-term costs of the alternatives. Is the cloud worth it? Well, that's a big question. We could probably spend a good uh, full session on that, right? Should I do a data mesh? I'm getting that question a lot today. What should I use for the storage layer of the platform? You know, which spec of AWS should I use for this project? Should I use big data, cloud storage or NoSQL, or should I use RDBMS? What should I use there? Is master data management worth it? That's, that's a TCO example, really, because my philosophy on master data management, which I talked about in a previous day diversity, uh, is that uh, we're all doing it. We just may not be doing it very well. So to do it the right way is a sort of a centralized approach. And sh why should I do that? And so I went through that in that in that webinar. You can go find it. But uh, and I've probably covered a lot of these actually. I haven't done data mesh yet. We'll talk about that later. But there are variations on the ROI theme, payback period analysis, return on investment, net present value, internal rate of return. Now I'm not going to go into the math of these things. Don't worry, <laughs> and don't you don't have to get to get your calculators out now. But um, these are simple formulas in Excel. You can figure them out. Uh, but the hard part is coming up with the cash flow. And when you come up with the cash flow, I suggest you come up with different possibilities and know that as you come up with the different possibilities for the cash flow, for the ROI of your analytics project, that people will hone in on one or the other. And I think as I put these out here, you can probably think about who, uh, you know, which, which profile that Marion Finance is going to hone in on and which profiles the CEO going to hone in on, et cetera. It kind of, a lot of it depends on where the company is in terms of spend. Now, I've been doing consulting for uh, 24, 25 years. So I've seen a lot. And I've seen companies go through, we're, we're spending a lot. We're, we're, we're going after things. We're, we're type A, you know, we're, we're knocking it out of the park. We're going to double down, et cetera. I, I've seen them go from that to, whoa, we're pulling, every, pulling all the reins in. We're slowing everything down. We're, we're looking at worst case. We're thinking about worst case in, in a matter of a month. And then back to, the, back to the former in three more months. And this, this happens maybe not on that tight, those tight windows, but this happens a lot. So it kind of depends on what stage your company is in. Are they going to hone in on your best case that you present, your plan case, which I suggest is in the middle, and the worst case? Most everything goes wrong. And I think it's perfectly okay to kind of show that if most everything goes wrong, whatever that means to your project, that you may have a negative return on investment. It's only realistic. Now, keep in mind that Mary in finance and everybody in finance uh, they will tend to zone in on that and say, well, this is what's going to happen. No, I didn't say that's what's going to happen. I've got these other cases, but we got to be realistic. So let's talk about tangible versus intangible metrics. Because if you're going to show ROI, you have to show tangible. Intangible doesn't work. Tangible are returns that you decide to measure. Many, more activities have a measurable return than you may think. You just might have to think hard. You might have to think deep. Remember my example of predictive maintenance. It's, it's a few levels, but it's there. Usually one to two returns are reasonable to measure for each project. Don't ask me to measure 10 returns on a projected project. I'll be here all day uh, and then some, all, all month really, or two. Um, we, that's not exactly uh, reasonable. The first two are gonna be the big heavy hitters and then the benefits uh, tail off from there. That's been my experience. So I'm just going to measure the one or two. And I'm going to say, this is probably what you're going to get. Intangible returns are si simply, the definition is returns you decide not to measure. I had somebody want to justify a project once on, uh, and this was quite some years ago, <laughs> as you'll know from the example, but on the paper say, because we won't be printing, we'll be going and we'll be interacting with the data on the computer. Well, uh, I, I said that was way too small potatoes. We can't do that. It's true, but uh, we can't do that. That's not going to justify an analytics effort spend of a million dollars. Okay, so so much for the paper. Let's let's keep going. I decided I decided not to measure the paper. I could have, 
And it would have probably shown a little bit of return, but I decided not to measure the paper. There are other more important things. Let's keep going. There's some other intangible benefits here that we like to throw around and think that, well, this is the end of the story, okay? Mic drop. I said clean data. Mic drop, the, uh, the organization is gonna go for it. Not quite, <laughs> not quite in my uh, uh, experience. Single version of the truth, improve customer satisfaction. We're getting a little closer with that one maybe. Enhance the corporate image, more time for staff development, mm, faster response to customers, getting close there. We get a data mesh. Uh, I can tell you at some level of the organization, these things do not cut the mustard. So let's, uh, let's, let's note them and enjoy them and measure them if you want, but they don't really go into any real justification. What does go into real justification? All right, that's what I wanna get at here. I definitely wanna leave you with a lot of good things that you can hopefully find your way into. Now, here's some examples. Increase in sales, that's number one. That's number one. If, if I can do that for a company with a project, wow, uh, I'm, going to get, I'm going to get funded. I'm going to get funded. If I can create efficiencies in processes, if I can drive out inefficiencies, in other words, if I can reduce inventory, if I can reduce returns or fraud or any form of computer security, if I can enhance it, um, if I can meet service level agreements that we have, these these are the, this is slide one of tangible returns. Stop right here. Hopefully you can find your way within these things. And by the way, this brings up a point that I wanna make here. Uh, mostly I get data and analytic professionals on a webinar like this. Um, we hold the keys to our company's success in the future, but we're way too often not assertive enough with that information. Um, we think that we're on the receiving end of what the project should be. I think we should be on the, on the front end of what the project should be because really, as I look around companies, only we know, only we know about artificial intelligence and machine learning and what it can do. So it behooves us to think about what those things that we know about can do for these important things within our companies increasing sales, creating efficiencies of process, and so on. So don't let the projects be formed without this great information we have in a partnership with our business peers within the company. And I know that's gotten a little bit harder with uh, everybody working from home, but we gotta, we gotta find a way. Here's some more. Well, actually, let me drill in on how analytics increases sales, because I said that was the big one, right? So let's talk about it a little bit more. Predict and prepare for likely sales. If we know they're coming, we're gonna be able to take them. We're not gonna be waiting for months to make, a, to make the sale and then it goes away. We're gonna be ready for it. May, I, that might mean uh, people power. That might mean something to do with our processes being ready, our customer service being ready in a certain way. But if we know what the sales are likely to be, uh, not in general, but from a customer set, from a certain customer, what have you, then we're going to be better off. Identify customer product likelihood to purchase. So we're not wasting time on pushing products to customers that they're not going to buy because it just doesn't match them. We're going to be better about the matching. When we have more information, more analytics, remember that's depth of data, we're going to be more better, more better, more better uh, in terms of identifying customer product likelihood to purchase. We're gonna be better off in sales because we're gonna be more efficient about it. Retain customers, trending to attrition. Well, how do we know? How do we know that they're trending to attrition? And by the way, every company is different in terms of the profile of the customer trending to attrition. Maybe they're pounding on the customer support. Maybe that doesn't matter. Maybe that's actually a sign that they're sticky. You know, you have gotta look at really what it comes down to for me is you gotta look at who has a trident and what were their patterns? And let's bring that back and look at some of the early stage of that pattern within the patterns of our current customer set and start to determine what we're going to do about it. And we probably don't want to keep every customer because some are not profitable or some we're going to target heavier than others. I'll put it that way. 
So we can't have one thing that we do for customers that are going to a trite. We have to have 10 things that we might do for customers that are going to a trite. Um, give them a new phone if you're in that if you're in that business. Free minutes, coupons, etc. Support customer engagement activities. Segment the customer base actionably, not randomly or because the book said to do it this way or that way, but segment them in a way that you can actually take action. Can you segment your customer base according to their size maybe? And that, that might determine who within your company supports them in a better way, something like that. Obviously optimizing pricing increases in sales. There's other ways, but I wanted to show you some of the uh, next level ways that analytics can improve sales, which I've said is pretty important. Now, let me get into some more tangible returns. Remember, I want everybody out there today to find their way within one of these tangible returns that I'm sharing with you today. This is slide two of them. Uh, your project today that you're working on, it's hopefully in one of these. And I bet it is. If, you don't, if you're saying, no, it's not, I, I, I bet it is. You just haven't thought it through to this level. So I would, I want you to have the walking around knowledge of what is the ROI of the project I'm working on today. I mean, put that on a sticky and put it on your mirror, your proverbial mirror, right? Because that's important. That's what you're all, the whole team is driving towards today and every day until it happens, right? It's that goal, whatever that goal is. So you should have a goal. You should know why you're doing what you're doing or somebody should, if it's not going to be you. Actually, I think everybody should, but uh, somebody should at a deeper level. Back to the slide. Okay. Procurement savings, savings in material costs for processing, savings from volume purchasing. I won't read them all. There you, get, there you see some more. Hopefully you can see how analytics is going to improve uh, these returns. Um, to use the ROI, you have to have tangible ret returns. It comes from these things. It comes from saving on downtime, saving on cost savings, uh, costs, that is, time to market, saving on cycle time, maintenance costs, production volume optimization, capacity utilization, saving on the number of defects, et cetera. So, and there's also things that are maybe a little bit more removed from tangible returns, but they're still there. Things like net promoter score. Now for some of you, now we I think we know what that is, right? That's a customer measurement of their happiness with us as a uh, company, right? So for some of us, we can say we've, we've measured how net promoter score goes right to the bottom line goes right to the bottom line. For others of us, we have not been able to do that. So it's going to be a little bit more removed. Sorry, we're going to have some dogs barking here. <laughs> um, things like net promoter score, things like average deal size, we can drive that up. The revenue by campaign, revenue by channel, the churn rate, customer lifetime value by segment, acquisition and retention costs by segment. All these things are tangible and we can hang our hat on them. And here's some more examples. Increased revenue per customer, increased customer uh, acquisition, okay, I'm back. Reduced cost of marketing campaigns, sorry about that. Decreased in customer attrition, improved employee productivity. Hmm. Some of these things are a little bit more removed from the bottom line, but they all are not so far removed that I would call them intangible by any stretch. Now, let me give you a real example. Okay, this is in healthcare. Let's say we're, let's say we want to analyze our claims and reroute claims to best of breed providers in the network. So if someone's having a coronary artery bypass or a C-section or something like that, um, we can make sure that they are matched with the best provider for that. Now, let's say we do this uh, successfully. We're going to be able to attract more customers if we do this, right? I think that providing good, good uh, services around these things would be something I'd be interested in in my healthcare provider. 
So we're we going to be able to get more customers. Yes, we're going to say in year two, just arbitrarily, I'm going to say year one is however long it takes to actually do the project. But in year two, we're going to attract 25 new customers. In year three, we're going to attract 30 new customers. Now, the average customer premium, let's say it doesn't change. It's 125,000. Obviously, we're talking about corporate customers here. The percent gross profit from the customer premium, we should know that already. We should know what that is and plug it in here. Now, obviously, I'm a little bit high level here. We would want to do this uh, with some more detail. But nonetheless, that's what it is. These are the total customer benefits. In year two, I hope to get 625,000 more in premium if I do this. In year three, 750,000 more in premium if I get that. Great, premium is great, right? But let's look at claims saved. If we're actually doing work better within the network, we're going to be able to save on claims. Nothing in year one, but in year two, save about 100 claims. Year three, we're gonna save about 150 claims. Average claim size, $25,000. Total claim cost savings, you see it there. And then you add the two together, that's the total impact. So about 3 million in year two, about four and a half million in year three. That's driving right to the bottom line. And so some people will ask at this point, well, what about year four? What about year five? Yeah, it's there, it's there, but don't get carried away. These projects do have a lifespan and then we gotta, we gotta do something um, better, I, I would say, uh, at that point. Uh, I'm Now, I'm really believing that these projects are going to be around and supporting the company and driving to the bottom line for a good 10 years. But still, we're going to be limited in what we can propose in terms of a time frame for the benefits for a project like this. And then we have abstracted ROI, which is impossibly measurable at the individual level. We cannot ever figure out at an individual level, individual customer level, let's say, how what we're going to do is going to impact the ROI of that customer. But we know that if we take a tranche of 100 customers, that's going to affect, say, 10 of them. And those, so we can do it at the group level. These are things like improving customer lifetime value, improving which spend decile customers are in or indirect measures like I talked be before about net promoter score. Net promoter score is going to, if we can improve that, let's say for our middle decile of customers, that's going to improve the profitability of that middle decile and their profitability is unique versus the other nine deciles if we've broken our customer base out in that way. So. This is what I mean by doing things at a group impact level. How does what we're doing work on the group? And we can use that in our measurements. So in summary, here is the methodology. Cost analysis, I didn't really go into that. By the way, if you want some cost analysis for analytics platforms with machine learning today, I highly suggest you take a look at last month's Dataversity webinar, because that was the focus of last month. And then we have tangible benefits analysis. Notice it's tangible benefits, it's not intangible benefits. It's just the things that we've decided to measure. And then we match the two together. That's your cash flow. We put it into the formulas that are appropriate for our company. We put them on a probability distribution, best case, worst case, plan case. We list the intangible benefits, but we're not going to hang our hat on it, but it's there, let's list them out. And then that drives into our prioritization and our planning decisions. Not that we are all going to do all, all, all of the bullets here, right? We may stop at, we're providing it all the way through the intangible benefits, and then somebody else gets to do the prioritization and planning. Or we could take a more leadership position and say, we're going to be proposing, et cetera, recommending, et cetera, on that last bullet, how to prioritize, how to plan, and take it all the way. Remember, if you come with reasonable approaches, you are way far ahead of the game. Don't, if you're not given the approach, like an A to Z cookbook of how to do this, then write it yourself. Write it yourself. Justify the project in your own way. 
prioritize the projects in your own way and give it a go and deal with the feedback that comes from something like that. Much better than sitting back and waiting and doing nothing. All right. So in summary for the whole presentation, target the business deliverables of the project. Use a repeatable, consistent process using governance. I didn't really talk a lot about governance, but I think it's pretty important. It's pretty important to the rules, the data rules that go into a catalog like Alation, but it's also pretty important for helping to understand how we are going to justify projects in the future. That whole deal of justifying projects is something that if a company can get really good at that and can get really good at designing and forming the projects, they are so far ahead. Uh, that is really something that we try to work on with all of our, our customers because that just it helps us get projects done and it helps the company. ROI is an important component of justification, but not the only one. I've shown you some things about it here today, but it's not the only one. Use lower TCO for program justification. So remember, you got to know if you got the project hat on or if you got the program hat on. And if the program hat is on, that's a, a way of doing things. That's the architecture hat. So that's more of a total cost of ownership. I could do it this way, or I could do it one of these other ways. Here's how, here's how much it's going to cost to do it one of these ways. Isolate project benefits and costs. That's the that's the uh, the slide with the sheep, right? That's putting the ring posts up around the sheep. That's herding the sheep into their projects. You've got to be able to do that as well. If it's important, you can measure it and you can improve it. And the project will almost always pay for itself. So if a project should pay for itself, you should do that project. However, there's a, there's a system within your company that you have to exceed a threshold. And that threshold varies according to company temperament at that time. I talked a little bit about that. And finally, even though I've given you some steps, I guess, I've given you some math, judgment is essential. Judgment is always essential. Not taking anything away from strategic projects, not taking anything away from judgment with this presentation. You got to keep that on throughout. And that is a summary of the presentation. I've been William McKnight, the president of McKnight Consulting Group. And I welcome you to submit your questions for a little Q&A that I'll bring Miles back in now for. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, Shannon, for the Q&A. William, thank you so much. Thanks to both of you for this great presentation. I Just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. Lots of questions coming in. If you have questions for either Miles or uh, William or both, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion. So diving in here, uh, how do I show ROI when my team is foundational, such as providing the catalog so that people can find the data quicker? Simply current time compared to reduced time? Um, I'll, I'll start on that one. I think that's that's one component that, that you can certainly measure, but I don't, I don't know if that'll win the day. I think you have to do a little bit more there. If you're just going to say that, well, people are going to be able to get their data faster, I want to know more about, pick some examples of, of how that's going to help. Uh, so what? Uh, how is that, that team over there getting data faster? How are they going to be able to uh, drive some ROI with that information? And I'm not talking about, you know, we, don't, we, we need less person power to, to do this work if we, if we have a great catalog in place. But I think a great catalog drives a lot more than that. I think it drives more benefits to the organization in terms of getting people enabled faster, getting them, getting them enabled at a deeper level. So this gets back to the slide, the conversation that I had about uh, driving in on, uh, on depth, depth of analysis. And I think that's where you find the ROI and things like that. Where's the, what is the depth of analysis uh, uh, without it? And what is the depth of analysis with it? And when you have that depth of analysis, what more can you do? How will that improve the supply chain, the this, that, and the other thing that you're really driving at, you know, in terms of your benefits? So I'll add that the, the way um, 
CIOs think about this is that there's a fundamental change going on in organizations today. Historically, you know, we would make decisions by a, a little bit of gut feel and a backward looking report. Today, what people are trying to do is to decide faster, to drive more agile organizations. And in that world, um, what you want to do is you want to enable people to directly discover, business users to directly discover data sources to immediately be able to assess uh, that that data is of sufficient quality for a decision and make decisions at the speed of today's business. Now, there's outcomes like um, you've seen uh, today uh, from Bill around, uh, you know, you're fixing the supply chain or you're enabling, as Albertsons did, to actually have um, you know, a more responsive, um, you know, more effective set of customer engagement. Um, so the outcomes are going to come from that. Uh, but the big driver of this is just the speed of business and the fact that if I go to a request model, I don't succeed. Now, there was a question in the chat I just wanted to go after quickly that had to do with uh, data quality. Obviously, there's a lot of techniques to cleaning data. Uh, the biggest thing is that you need to be able to discover um, where data has uh, quality issues. Now you can do that through collaboration, but you can also do that through data quality tools. And what they try to do in, in a mix of automations and uh, things that you create is to create metrics that are going to tell you, gee, is this data uh, trustworthy or not? Um, and so, and then obviously then you may have to go back and remediate that data to make it um, uh, fixed, um, uh, but but the first thing is knowing that the data is trustworthy for decision maker, whether it's an analytic model being created or simply I've got a metric and I'm trying to make sure that we're delivering against it. I love it. Thank you. And I'm going to see if I can slip in one more question here. Any thoughts on uh, ROI in a government context where bottom line isn't always emphasized? Yeah, I get that question a lot um, when, I, when I give a presentation of this form. I, th I think you just have to target uh, something else, um, something that may or may not have bottom line spend and profit uh, related to it. However, before I just completely absolve uh, the, the uh, government uh, um, organization, from ROI, I will say that I have noticed that they've gotten quite a bit more, uh, I'll say progressive lately in terms of uh, looking at things like ROI. And so I wouldn't necessarily say that uh, if you're in government that you don't have to care about this at all. Uh, maybe the, the questioner is, is in government and knows that this is true, that they, that they, uh, that they really don't have to. Uh, so there I would say, uh, be progressive, be the one that does care about it, be the one that does show it. You don't have to, it, obviously, if it's not part of, if it's not a huge part of the justification, great, you've done it. You've still got something that you can focus the team around in terms of, you know, where you're going. But I think there are definitely, in whatever we do, there are metrics. And the idea here is to find the metric that's important and drive the team towards that, putting that on that proverbial sticky on the mirror and driving the team towards that metric, whatever it may be. Yeah, I just add that you maybe you're not talking about plural rates or something like that in a government context, but I think there's this notion of stewardship um, that you think about in government. And, and when you're a good steward, you're using the resources as efficiently and effectively as you can as well as oftentimes if you're able to be a little more efficient, it means you can take on a bigger portion of the mission of the organization and maybe help deliver that more effectively. Yeah. I love it. So um, just a very quick elevator pitch. We got you know just a minute here. Can you provide more insight on cleaning the data and how does it affect quality assurance? Process. So uh, I actually have a whole presentation on this that I believe I've given 
in this series at some point in the past. Uh, it, it's titled something like data quality return on investment. And there I, sh there I go through the process of talking about how you can have different levels of data quality that will impact the bottom line of that particular project in different ways. And you can find the point at which uh, it makes sense because obviously you have to put an in investment into data quality. It's not free. So you have to put that investment in, you can put in different levels of investment and get different levels back. But sometimes you're past the point of diminishing returns as we say with data quality investment. However, uh, I would say most projects, if not all projects really do need some measure of data quality. They have to be working on quality data just to be effective, period. And uh, beyond that though, we can get into, you can, you can achieve different levels. You're never going to get 100%, but you can achieve different levels with different levels of input. And it's all about showing how the different levels of data quality drive to the bottom line of that initiative. Let's say it's targeted marketing. You're going to have better a better mailing list, let's say. That means more people are going to get it, which means more people are going to uptake it and that sort of thing. So that's always there. It might just be a little bit, a little bit removed depending upon the project. And I'll just end with a humorous story. And that is that uh, there was a large consumer goods company that I met with several years ago, and they very explicitly wanted the business to understand how bad the data was. So they didn't suggest data quality initially. And then they, they gave the business the data and the business immediately understood that there were quality issues. And, and they said, oh, well, that'll be some extra money to your program. So it, it was kind of funny that they let the business discover on their own how bad their data was. <laughs> Sounds good. Perfect. I love it. Thank you both so much uh, for this presentation. But it, that is afraid, I'm afraid that all the time we have for today. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides, links to the recording. Thank you both so much. Thanks to Elation for helping to make these webinars happen. Appreciate it. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks all.